bio, what? The border agent looks at me, a confused look on his face. It's 2009, I'm at the Canadian border, crossing back into Michigan from Ontario. Biostatistics, I repeat calmly. It's the application of statistics to medicine and public health. That's a bit above my pay grade, he chuckles, and I laugh nervously. Moments later, my car is surrounded by heavily armed agents all dressed in black. I feel like I'm Jason Bourne. Jason Bourne, biostatistician. <laughs> they ask me to hand over my keys and tell me I'm being detained. Why did you go to Pakistan last year, they ask me. Um, to visit my grandfather? How long have you been in the US? My whole life. What were you doing in Canada? I was curious about what was north of Michigan, so I went for a drive. <laughs> but to northern Ontario, who goes there? Yeah, to White River. So now, White River might sound scenic, but to be fair, it's the middle of nowhere. Um, there's nothing in White River. There isn't even an actual river. Um, you can, uh, here's a map to give you some context. Uh, the agents tell me that my, uh, this is, yeah, no, it's literally nowhere. It's the middle of nowhere. But uh, there's another slide that actually shows you where it is. <laughs> All right, good job. <laughs> I'm glad I rehearsed this like 100 times, um, including with the technical difficulty. OK, so the agents tell me that my pattern of behavior resembles that of a drug trafficker, um, who also would be a biostatistics grad student. What a perfect cover. Um, so they're going to search my car. So I wait 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Finally, an hour has passed. I go back up to the counter. How long is this going to take, I ask. Why don't you take a seat, says one of the officers. Only it doesn't sound like he's asking me. I'm sorry, is that an order, I ask. Two other officers have now joined him. Why don't you take a seat, he repeats, a little more menacingly. Suddenly, I remember something I had read on a sign on the wall. If you feel you are not being treated professionally, ask to speak with the supervisor. I'd like to speak with the supervisor, I announce. <laughs> Immediately, the men step back. A nice older woman steps up in their place. She listens to my grievances. A few minutes later, they return with my passport. You've been cleared, they tell me. So I drive back to Ann Arbor. Um, I'm hanging out with a friend, you know, having lunch on campus. He asked me, you know, what did you do last weekend? So note, I hate this question because I never have a good answer to this question. <laughs> but now I do. So I tell him the story beginning to end, and he's just like, Wow, that's so cool. And he says, you have to write about this. Because if it's happening to you, it's happening to other people who don't have the same privilege, the same opportunities, the same ability to communicate you have. And maybe you can help those people by writing your story. And my initial reaction is to roll my eyes. I mean, I'm a grad student in biostatistics. I'm not a journalist. Um, but he's insistent, and my curiosity gets the better of me. So I write up my account. I title it dramatically, White Rivers, Brown Skin, and Black Deeds, into the rabbit hole of border detentions and racial profiling. <laughs> That's the article. And uh, if you want to buy the movie rights, talk to me afterwards. I would like to play myself. Jason Bourne is, uh, is a, doesn't quite have my melanin. Uh, <laughs> um, and I write this article. I send it to an editor at the Huffington Post, and it gets published the next day. This is my first time ever published in a national outlet. And I'm ecstatic. And I feel really good, but I want you to understand that I also felt a little uncomfortable. Because I felt as if I was on a brink. Because here I am, grad student in biostatistics, and I thought, what am I doing writing articles and doing journalism? And I think this is where too often we pursue the path of least resistance. We're not thoughtful enough about what we want to do in our lives. What are the questions we're deeply curious about? Now, Bulle Shah is a Punjabi Sufi poet uh, who lived in the 18th century. And he says, par par ilm te fazil hoya, te kade apne aap no nahi. He says, you have read so many books and you became a scholar, but you never read the book of your own life. You never read your own self. And in that moment, as I read myself with this experience, I almost felt as if I were a caterpillar. I was a caterpillar. I had always been safe in a cocoon, a cocoon of academia, a cocoon where I had an identity. And I felt as if I were emerging from this cocoon, I was becoming a butterfly. And it was hard in the beginning, because part of me was tugged into this, you know, I was a biostatistician. Um, next slide. Uh, you can see, uh, yes. So yeah, that's literally a screenshot from one of my final exams for survival analysis. Um, so on one side, I was a biostatistician doing proofs, proving theorems, learning about survival analysis. On the other hand, I was in Detroit uh, investigating the murder of an imam who had been killed in an FBI raid. And I sort of lived this double life. Uh, and I felt like a butterfly. 
Um, so now I had these two wings, but they weren't really in harmony. It was just like I'd be a, a statistician in class, and then I'd be a journalist. And I felt like this, it, it was a tension. It was a tension, but I also feel like it was an opportunity. Because now all of a sudden I didn't have one identity, one title I had to cling to. I could be more than one thing. And I had faith that as long as I stayed the course with both of my passions, I would eventually find my calling. And as I heard the other speakers today, I feel like this is what the brink is. The brink is where our life experiences intersect, and it's where we're able to truly do something different and make a difference. Thank you. So fast forward seven years. Seven years, a long time. Yeah, I look really young. but um, it's, uh, it's 2016. I'm sitting at home in Queens. I'm eating a pint of haagen pistachio ice cream. And a lot has happened in my life in the past few years. I finished my master's at Michigan. I spent a year at the University of Chicago as a PhD student. I worked on Ron Paul's campaign, libertarians in the house. No, no OK, a, a few. It's OK. We can still be friends. Uh, I worked at a startup called Graph Science. Uh, I worked at Facebook, which is a big social networking site. And uh, I, uh, I've done a lot of things. So I'm sitting at home. I'm scrolling through my news feed. And all of a sudden, Brexit happens. And like most of us, I get my news through secondhand through Facebook. So Brexit, Brexit, and like all my friends are talking about it. And then I come across an article which really catches my eye. It's called The World's Reaction to Brexit in Emoji. Now, short pause. I am fascinated by emojis. I always have been. When I first got a smartphone, I had a friend who would text me, you know, just these emojis. And I was like, does it literally mean you're crying and while you're laughing? Like, that's so cool. Like, can I study that? Um, and I, I was like, what is the difference between a tiger emoji and a lion emoji? And like, what is the difference between a red heart and a green heart? Like, does it mean she likes me? I don't know. It's so complicated. Uh, and I think at this point, my brain was still siloed off. I had a journalist side. I had a data scientist side. I had a side that liked emojis. And I was never able to bring them. I, and I had a side that liked pistachio ice cream, obviously. Um, and I wasn't able to bring them together. But I think when I saw this article, I was like, OK, this is awesome. Like, they actually did what I've always wanted to do. They're using data science to study the world's reaction to emojis. Um, and then I clicked through to the article. And uh, this is what I found. So the article itself is, you know, Francois Hollande, sad emoji. Angela Merkel, angry emoji. Donald Trump, um, hands praying emoji. That's the whole article. And I was like, actually, this is kind of lame. Um, and I was about to complain about it. You know, I was like, OK, what a lame article in courts. I'm never going to wear their watches again. It's, it's a joke. It's a bad joke. Um, so uh, it's a publication, and it's a watch company. OK, cool. So and I was going to complain about it. But then I remember something my sister tells me, which she says, don't complain about the media. Become the media. And here I am. I'm a journalist. I'm a data scientist. I love emojis. I can actually do something about it. Um, and when I think about that, journalism, data science, liking emojis, I was kind of like a triple threat. <laughs> and I was a butterfly. So I, I locked myself in my room, and I s engaged in a one-man 72-hour hackathon. Uh, I learned how to use the Twitter API. I downloaded 100,000 tweets about Brexit. I learned how to extract emojis from those tweets. And I wrote a 1,000-word article called The Emojis of Brexit. I emailed it to an editor at Vice uh, at 8 PM on a Tuesday night. 17 minutes later, she responds. She's like, this is great. We're going to run it tomorrow. And that's how I became an emoji data scientist. And it was published the next day. Um, and I had so much fun when I was doing this. And I realized if I had approached Brexit purely as a journalist, you know, I might have thought, wrote, written about the implications for the EU or talked to some professors. If I had approached it purely as a data scientist, I might have done some research on currency fluctuations or spot prices. If I had approached it as someone who loves emojis, I might have gone through my Twitter feed and looked at people's emojis. But only by putting on all of my hats, journalist, data scientist, emoji enthusiast, was I able to do something novel. Um, was I able to do something different? Only by bringing together all of my unique life experiences. And uh, you know, so you can see some of the emojis of, of Brexit, where essentially we found two things. One, people use emojis to express a wide range of emotions on issues they care about. Um, there's happiness, sadness, clapping, crying. It's all there. And you also notice that certain emojis correlate with the hashtags people use. So this is obvious to us, but to anyone older than 35, this is like, whoa, we thought emojis were just random and boring. But actually, the people who were happy Brexit happened, when they tweet, vote, leave, they're tweeting the British flag emoji. They're tweeting the party hat emoji, because they're really happy it happened. Yes, that's crazy. 
And then people who are sad it happened, who are tweeting, vote, remain, not my vote, they're crying, they're praying that they do a revote. Um, and stuff that's like really interesting, like actually, yeah, emojis are not completely random. There's actually quite a bit of interesting signal there. So yeah, I had a lot of fun doing that in case you couldn't tell. More fun than I had as a biostatistician. And uh, I started an emoji data science lab called Prismoji. And since then, I've looked at emojis and the Kanye West, Taylor Swift controversy. <laughs> I've uh, looked at emoji. Uh, I've looked at emoji usage on election day. I've done a deep dive in the peach emoji, into the peach emoji. <laughs> a lot of you guys, I'm sure, are, are big fans. And uh, I've, uh, <laughs> I've looked at the, uh, I need extra time in my talk, because that slide gets like a minute of laughter. People just can't stop laughing. And I've looked at the emojis of resistance. Um, the last one is especially personal for me. Um, so after the Muslim ban was announced, um, my sister and I, we went to JFK because everyone was protesting there. A lot of lawyers had gathered there. Um, so my sister works for the government. So she huddled with like the, the city hall staffers table and she was make, doing useful things. I went to the lawyers table and said, hey, like I like emojis and I watch Law and Order. Can I help you guys? And uh, they were like, oh, we don't know about that. And I was like, oh crap. Okay, so I went home. But when I went home, I was like, oh, actually, I can look at emojis people use when they're using these hashtags. No ban, no wall, no Muslim ban, not my president. And what are the emojis they're using? Um, so I published a story in Emojipedia. It quickly went viral. Um, basically, the fascinating thing we found is that it, the fist is the emoji of resistance, as I, as I tried to patent. Um, it's not patented, but yeah, it's the fist. Um, but also the American flag, because a lot of protest is motivated by a deep sense of patriotism. Um, people are using the American flag when they're saying, hey, this travel ban is not in line with our values. Um, people are using the heart emoji because there's a lot of love for refugees and for immigrants. And all of that was really cool. Um, Mashable made this their Snapchat story for that whole day. So that's my, uh, my claim to fame for anyone who is into Snapchat stories. Um, what I learned from this, always be on the lookout for the unique contribution that only you can make. And chances are you'll find it at the intersection of all of your life experiences. So now, I'd like to give you a teaser of some of my latest work. Um, if you recall, initially when I was a caterpillar, I was, you know, I was a caterpillar and then I became a butterfly and then I was like a data scientist, I was a journalist, it was like a mess up butterfly. And uh, gradually I was like, okay, emojis, like I can, I can do both and it's fun. But now I realize, you know, there's just so, mu there's so many places uh, that that can take. Um, there's so many op opportunities that come my way when I have this uniform way of looking at the world. So in my latest work, I play data science to journalism to understand the media. So let me give you an example. A few months ago, I'm at a hackathon in Boston eating pistachio ice cream. And uh, this, this woman asked me, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Brooklyn. She goes, yay, Williamsburg. And I say, no, that's not where I'm from. <laughs> I don't know if this ever happens to you guys. I hate it when this happens to me. I say, I'm from Marine Park. Now by a show of hands, who here has ever heard of Marine Park? Six people, and three of them are in my family, so. <laughs> <laughs> Who here has ever heard of Williamsburg? Almost everyone in the room. So now this might seem like a coincidence to you, but as, you know, so I actually went to the census, and I said, how many people live in these neighborhoods? And Marine Park actually has more people than Williamsburg. Williamsburg has 120,000. Uh, Marine Park has 170,000. So okay, these are two equally sized neighborhoods that are not being covered similarly. So then I looked at news articles mentioning each of these neighborhoods. I found 150,000 articles mentioning Williamsburg and only 5,000 mentioning Marine Park. That's a 50 to 1 disparity, which is kind of crazy. And then, so people talk about food deserts. I love pistachio ice cream, so obviously I think about food deserts, because um, sometimes it's the only thing they have at the corner store. Um, but I think we can also think about news deserts. And news deserts are huge swaths of New York City, in Brooklyn and Queens and Staten Island, that just are not covered in the news. Um, so we took a deeper dive during this hackathon I was at, and we looked at the headlines, the top words and headlines and articles mentioning Marine Park. And the top words we found are old, man, and arrested. <laughs> now, this would make sense if Marine Park was a really like, dangerous neighborhood, but it's not. It's a very safe Irish-Italian neighborhood. If you go there, I encourage you to check out Frank's Pizzeria. And uh, if you look at Williamsburg, articles about Williamsburg, the top words are new, man, and bar. And this is something really, I don't think it's, it's conscious. It's, I don't think these newspapers are consciously doing this, but I think it just happens. Um, these are unconscious biases that replicate themselves in broader society. And I think this is such a powerful example for me of if I had approached this news deserts problem as a journalist, 
You know, I would have written articles about it. If I had approached it as a community activist, I would have held rallies and said, you know, Marine Park is not a place where old men get arrested. Um, <laughs> if I was just a data scientist, I would have written some machine learning algorithm. But I'm not just one of these things. I'm all of these things. So I brought together all of my hats. I did this analysis um, where uh, we, we are applying for some grants. So stay, uh, stay, stay tuned to see what happens with this. Um, but I think what I really learned from this is uh, when we combine our life experiences, when we truly read ourselves, as Bulle Shah says, that's when we'll figure out what are the unique contributions we can make. So as you leave today, I encourage you to go through your life experiences, figure out what are the unique things that make you who you are, and how can you combine those together to really satisfy your curiosity, to make an impact, to do things that you're proud of. Um, go, as you go out, I encourage you to become your inner butterfly, and then go out and fly. Thank you. Yeah.